there, welcome to Share Your Story and Inspire Others. I am Fiona Brennan, your host. I'm a personal success coach, founder of Inspire Action Success. And here in conjunction with Global Maps events, I share with you beautiful stories from heart-centered entrepreneurs around the globe. This show is for entertainment purpose only and the views of our guests are not necessarily the views of Inspire Action Success or Maps Global events. Enjoy. I am joined by Kevin Parker, all the way from the US. Kevin, I am delighted to have you here today with me. It's a pleasure to be Thank here. You Thank much. you so much. Um, so Kevin, you are um, a winning against all odds, speaker, coach, and best-selling author, correct? That's and you correct. have the book actually there with you, uh, Winning Against All Odds, Yes. which is brilliant. So we'll share that again at the end. Fabulous, mm -hmm. fabulous. Your business is True Warrior and you're a men's success coach. Correct. And you help men to unlock their true potential and release their true warrior from within. That is correct. Excellent. Wonderful. I love that. I love that. So, Kevin, you've got a great story to share and a great message at the end of it. Um, so let's just hit right into it and just tell me a little bit, go back to maybe the very beginning of who you were, where you grew up and take us through a little bit of a journey of um, how you got to where you are today. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show today. Uh, my situation and my problem started at a very young age. At two years old, uh, my mother moved in with my stepfather. He had two sons. Unfortunately, the youngest one, which was my age, got attacked by a wolf at two years old. Oh, my God. Completely goodness. mutilated okay. his face, ripped off his scalp, and even took one of his ears. And from this trauma that nobody should ever go through, he became very mean and vicious and envious of other kids, and me moving into his house, he thought I was the enemy. I was a perfect little boy, uh, I was half his size, and he never missed an opportunity to physically, mentally, and emotionally abuse me. So at a very, very young age, I was depressed, and I was suicidal. I remember telling my mom at five years old I wanted to kill myself, and she was beside herself. She couldn't understand why. But, you know, everything is pain is subjective. So you can't really understand what somebody's going through. You can't understand what they see. You can't walk in their shoes. And as a five-year-old, I want to kill myself. Uh, I found solace and peace in doing drugs at 10 years old. I started smoking and drinking on a daily basis. Uh, before I knew it, by high school, I did just about every drug you could think of. And I was selling drugs just to get by. Uh, high school, I played baseball and football. I was super smart. I was in the honors class, and I was creating this false bravado of who I really was to fit in. And I became very popular, but my grades declined. And I got through high school by the skin of my teeth. I watched all my friends go away to their dream colleges where I just basically got through and flushed all my potential. And I was very resentful to that. At 18 years old, I went to a community college. At 18 years old, I got hit by a bus. I injured my neck and my back, and I got severely, severely addicted to painkillers. This is when my life started to spiral out of effect. Uh, mm -hmm. I had no control. Before I knew it, I looked around. Every friend I ever had, every girlfriend, every opportunity, anything that was worth of value was gone. I was sitting there beside myself. I was losing my mind. I got arrested a few times. I was in bad debt with a guy that wanted to kill me, and I didn't know what to do. I was lost, and again, for the second time in my life, I was suicidal. I was full of anxiety. I was afraid I was going to get arrested. Somebody was going to come into my door and kill me. And I, I didn't know what to do. And I just thought it was better off I'd off myself. So I just got even worse into drugs. And eventually, I ended up homeless. I was homeless for a little while. My father looked at me and said, Kev, you could stay with me. He let me stay for about six months until he gave me an ultimatum. He said, Kevin, listen, you're messed up, man. You need help. And I looked at him with a straight face, probably drooling on myself because I was high as a kite and said, I don't need no help. I'm not high. I don't, I, I'm just tired. He said, Kevin, listen, if you don't get help right now, you leave right now for a two year program, you got to get out of my house and never look back. And me being all prideful, I was like, the hell with this. I'm out of here. I don't need this. I packed all my stuff in a book bag. I threw my safe on my shoulder and I stormed out the house like I was showing them. I walked about a half a mile in the freezing cold in a tank top with tears running down my face with a, show, or a safe on my shoulder, looking like a madman. It must have looked like I just stole a safe from somebody. I walked to my best friend's house. 
I convinced his mother that my family hated me, that I had nowhere to go. She said, you can stay here as long as you want because her son was just as messed up. And I used to help her with him. That night, she cooked me a bowl of macaroni and cheese. And let me tell you, it should have been the last meal of my life because everybody woke up except me. They found me face first in my vomit, blue, completely unresponsive. The next thing I knew was I was waking up in the ICU three weeks later from a coma. Wow. I found out that in that coma, I died three times. On the third time, it got so bad, they had a priest come in and read me my last rites. Just as all my friends and family were saying their goodbyes with no, no warning in sight, I just woke up. It was a miracle. There was no shot that I was supposed to survive. When I woke up, the first thing I seen was my mother's face. And when I did talk, and um, it still gets me teary today because it looked like she aged 10 years since the last time I seen her. And, you know, I may not have loved myself, but I love my mother more than anything in the whole world. And uh, mm. when I realized I did that to her, I knew I had to make a change. I knew I had to make a difference. I had to make it up. I had to start living. And uh, the doctor looked at me and said, Kevin, it doesn't look good. I had tubes coming out of my throat, tubes coming out of my lungs, out of my feeding tube, everything. I mean, I couldn't even tell my mother I was sorry. And the doctor said, it doesn't look good. If you survive, if and only if you survive, you're going to lose all four of your limbs. You're going to be completely brain dead. You're never going to be the son your mother once knew. You have multi-organ failure right now. Your liver, kidneys, lungs, heart, brain, all completely shut down. You have 108 fever right now. We have you on the ice blankets. Your brain is frying. Don't expect anything if you survive. That's what they were telling me. And to me, this was worse than death. I started praying to a God I didn't even know. At the time, I was an atheist, but in the coma, I had a very spiritual experience. And I knew something was up there. And I just started praying to, to a God I didn't know, begging and pleading for a second chance. And I remember thinking, man, if you just give me a second chance, if you give me one more shot, I promise I'm going to make a difference. I promise I'll change. I promise I'll change somebody's life. Just... Just give me one more shot. And for weeks, I got no response until one day the doctor walked in and he said, Kevin, I got some good news, but I have some bad news. The good news is I think you're going to make it. I think you're out of the woods. The bad news is we're going to have to take your leg or you're going to die. Now, that was a lot better than what the doctor told me before. But a lot of emotions went through my head. Anger, regret, resentment, frustration, humiliation. But amongst all of these things, there was one emotion I had to hold on to the tightest. And that was the emotion of gratitude. Being grateful I was still alive. See, I battled in that hospital for four months, not knowing if I was going to live or die. They had me on their breathing machine. They would lower the oxygen just low enough so I'd have to struggle for each and every single breath, but high enough so I wouldn't die. It felt like I was being waterboarded for weeks on end. It was the most torture I ever went through in my life, even above getting my leg chopped off, which was extremely painful. I went through so many different complications in the hospital. But after four months, I got out. And one of the things that I learned from this is no matter what your circumstances, no matter who you are, your support system is your number one asset in life. Because when your back's up against the wall and you have no other options, it's your support system that's going to get you through. Not everybody can get through everything all the time. You're going to struggle. You're going to need help. You're going to need support. Reach out. There are people that care about you, people that love you more than you love yourself. And that's the most powerful resource you'll ever have is your support system, whether it's family, friends, God, uh, a facility, a doctor, whatever it is, there's people out there to help you. Now, although I went through all this physical struggle, I thought the battle was over, but when I got home, I realized it just begun. Oh. When I rolled up to my house in my wheelchair and realized I had to get up a flight, a flight of stairs, two flights of stairs to get up to my house, it might as well have been a mountain. It took me every ounce of strength that I can muster. Every single piece of will. It took me an hour and a half to get up those stairs. When I got to my bed, I collapsed in pure exhaustion. And that's when it all hit me, that I was all alone, that I had no career, 
that my girlfriend just left me that day, that I had no friends, no real friends anymore, that I had no purpose, no passion, no identity. I wanted to kill myself for the third time. It all hit me like a ton of bricks. But I remembered that moment when I was begging and pleading for a second chance with God. Mm. And I, although this wasn't the second chance I would have chosen, nonetheless, my prayers were answered and I had to hold my end of the bargain. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting there wallowing in my self-pity. My stepmother comes up to me and, and suggests I read a book, The Secret. I don't know if anybody's ever read the book, The Secret. Mm -hmm. But it's about the law of attraction. Like attracts like. Yeah. Napoleon Hill said it best. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Mm -hmm. And this was a powerful notion for me. It gave me hope. It gave me strength. I started writing on a list of all the things that I thought I'd never be able to do. You know, and I thought I was never going to find a job. I wanted to be able to walk again. I wanted to make friends. I wanted to find a woman that would love me. Because I knew there were billions of men walking around with two legs. So it was unfathomable to me. But I realized I had to get off of drugs before I did anything because they still had me on drugs in the hospital. And there was no way anybody was ever getting me back into a rehab facility after four months of being in that hospital. So I decided to white knuckle it. And I don't know if any of you um, guests have ever tried to beat opioid addiction, but it's absolute torture. Picture having the worst flu that you've ever had in your life. And every ounce of physical, mental, and emotional pain that you should have felt while using that drug and you were numb all hit you at once. Mm. It's torture. But you know what? I got through it. And it was the first thing that I did on myself, by myself, on my own. And it started to give me a little strength. Now, my next step was I had to figure out how I was going to ever walk again. So I went to the prosthesis store. If I asked the doctor, I was like, sir, um... What does it look like? How does it look, Doc? When am I going to be able to walk? He said, it doesn't look good. You're 100 pounds soaking wet. I'm 225 right now. So picture skin and bones at that point. Uh, he said, you're skin and bones. You, you have nerve damage throughout your body. You have drop wrist, atrophy. It doesn't look good. It's probably going to take you about two years to learn how to walk. <laughs> when I heard this, I was pissed off. I almost cursed the doctor out. I was like, no offense, Doc, but don't tell me what I'm going to do. I'll show you. And I wheeled out of there like a madman. I came back two weeks later with just a cane. The doctors tried to grab me. I said, don't you dare touch me. I'm going to do this my way. I came back just two weeks later, completely unassisted. The doctors were blown away. They couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it myself from their um, reaction. So I started working. I realized the power of momentum and gaining strength and taking baby steps so I started working on these things every single day. And one month later, I gathered my friends and family together and a video recorder, and I had them record me running down the block. Oh now picture this. The doctor tells me it's going to take me two years to learn how to walk. I was running in two months. So oh what I've learned from that is don't ever let anyone ever tell you what you can or cannot do in your life. Your only obstacles are your mindset and your faith. You can do absolutely anything. And the last little story I'll tell you about my rehabilitation before I really get into some good stuff is I had complete drop wrist in my hand. And the neurologist said that I'd never be able to move my hand again. It was never going to work. I just might as well accept having a limp hand. And again, I was, that was unacceptable to me. I was like, you're not going to tell me I can't move my hand again. I've been doing this my whole life. I was like, I'm going to show you. So I stared at my hand for nine months and it didn't move. I would talk to it every single day. Come on, we've been doing this our whole lives. Just move. I don't got nothing else to do until you start moving. And then one day, my finger wiggled. And that's all I needed to know. Started getting my finger to move, my hand to move, my wrist. Now I have about 90% movement in my hand. I can't do certain things, but I'm super excited that I can use it. Oh, yeah. uh, and it's just been showing me that you can really do anything that you can do. You can unlock your full potential if you want to. Uh, humans and the bodies we have are absolute miracles. They could do absolutely anything, but what you put into them, they're going to put out. Everything you eat, everything you hear, everything you see, anything you in your diet that you take in, your body computes and puts it out. That's how your whole body regenerates. That's how, that's how your mind works, your subconscious works. Everything is programmed through the diet that you put into you. 
So I started really gathering this and I was, I'm a very obsessive impulsive person. So I turned my biggest weakness into my biggest strength. I was an addict. So I got addicted to going to the gym. I got addicted to self-development. I read well over 250 self-development books. I started following Tony Robbins around the country, Les Brown, John Maxwell, all the gurus that knew all the stuff that I wanted to know because I had nothing. I had to recreate my identity at 25 years old. And it was hard. You know, there was times that I didn't believe in myself. There was times that I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew that I was capable. I knew I had a second chance. I knew I was here for a reason. And I knew most of all that I had a really great support system. I got closer with my mother, my father, my brother. They were so proud of me. For the first time, they were proud of me in years. And I held on to that, that emotion, because, you know, motion creates emotion. So if you get up and do something, you're going to create that emotion, you know, and it's a cascade, physical, you got to get physical, then you get emotional, you handle the emotional aspect, and then you get the mental aspect. It, they feed into one another. It's like a trilogy. So, you know, I started working on things individually and they all started to move into each other, but I wanted to help. I wanted to give back because I promised God that I was going to make a difference in this world. And there was all these terrible stories about people overdosing on painkillers. So I wrote my story to the front, to the advance. And within 30 minutes, one of the producers, uh, write, the editors write me back and they say, we absolutely love your story. We love to put it on the front page of the Sunday advance. And I got so much clout, so much attention from this. All these different organizations reached out to me. They'd be like, we'd love for you to speak at our event and tell your story. Now, might I add, I've never spoken publicly in my whole life, but I knew I had to do it. And you know mm. what? Sometimes saying yes to life is the bridge that's going to bring you your fulfillment and happiness. Yeah. And I was afraid. But courage is not the absence of fear. It's seeing the fear and working through it. So the first time I had to speak at an event, I was the keynote speaker and I ever spoke in my life. I get up there, I got my glasses on, my glasses are fogging up because I'm sweating. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. like stuttering, I'm hyperventilating. I got this crumpled piece of paper I'm, and I can't get, I'm like, I'm going to die in front of everybody right now. I don't know how this is going to work. But you know what? I got through the whole thing. I got through it. And at the end, there was a standing ovation. And it was the highest I've ever felt in my entire life that feeling of contribution, that feeling of growth, that feeling of love and connection and significance. I mean, it fulfilled all six of the human needs that are there. And we won't get into that here because we don't have enough time. But it was the most fulfilling experience that I ever had in my whole life. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to inspire people. I want to motivate people. So I started getting certified in all kinds of different coaching modalities. I started working on my speaking. I started doing everything really recovery and helping people overcome addiction and break free from the chains of addiction. And, you know, I made a great name for myself. I've hate, helped hundreds and hundreds of people. And, uh, you know, it really fulfilled my heart in like a way that I can't even describe to anybody. It was just my purpose is to help people. I love it. I don't care about money, although I've made some, uh, but it's about the, the mission. It's about the purpose. But this started really diving me into the aspect of, of living your truth. Because, because I always suffered with anxiety and depression. And if you're not living your truth, you're going to feel unfulfilled. You're going to feel cheated. You know, if you're a people pleaser and you do whatever people say to do and you don't get your own needs met, you're going to have that all bottled up and it's going to kill you inside. So what I started learning is about masculine and feminine energy. And I went on this huge journey of learning how women work and how men work. And I'm not just saying men have to be masculine or women have to be feminine. We both have both energies inside yeah. of us, yeah. but we all have, we are all generally dominant in one and you have to live your truth, whatever that is. See, I'm a very masculine man, but I could be super feminine because I could be very heart centered and loving and, and creative and all those beautiful things. And I think they both have an incredible role in society yeah. and in people's lives. Yeah. And I just love to show people how to live their truth how to be the best person they possibly could be. So I've, I've, I've created a coaching program called the True Warrior Success Method. It's seven scientifically proven steps to help men unlock their true potential and unleash their true warrior within. 
because I know it's necessary in society right now. I don't know. A lot of people are struggling. A lot of things are being confused and oh. convoluted and all kinds of crazy things. And, you know, the families are falling apart. And I just want to train men to be the best men that they can be, the best husbands they can be, the best fathers they can be, the most passionate, purpose-driven, mission-based men that can lead a family, that can provide, that can protect, that can make people safe and comfortable with integrity and love and passion. And it just, like, you can see I get excited when I talk about this because it's just, my hair stick up when I talk every time. I talk about it every time my hair stick up because it's, I'm living my truth. Yes. And I still help people with addiction. I still help people with uh, mental health issues. I have a psychology degree. Uh, I just didn't want to get my master's in license because then you get restricted into doing something and there's a lot of HIPAA and all kinds of crazy stuff. So I do coaching. I do speaking. I do coaching. And this book, Winning Against All Odds, uh, is an international bestseller. And I promised my stepmother on her dying deathbed, she was like, you know, you're going to make a difference in this world. You're going to write a book that's going to change people's lives. And at the time I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, no problem. Whatever you say, because I wanted to comfort her. But it kept eating me alive and eating me alive and eating me alive. And, you know, it took me about two years to write this book, but it's the best thing that I've ever done. Uh, it's really, really incredible. I actually give out free PDF copies. I love to give them out to your audience if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so if you if you text the word warrior okay. to 55312, it'll yeah. give you all my information. And there's a and there's a and there's a link that says get your free PDF copy of my best-selling book, and I'll send you the whole entire thing. You can enjoy it. That's my gift to you guys. That's my gift from being on the show and being able to add some type of value to your audience. Because, like I said, I just want to give. I want to help people, and I truly believe the book, my message, and what I stand for can really, really exponentially grow people's lives, their fulfillment, their happiness, and joy. And that's what I live for. I don't care. I don't care what I go through, what I have to go through, how hard I got to work, but I want to make an impact on this world. I want to impact a million people before I die. And that's why I'm on this podcast because it's, it's all about reaching more people. Yeah. I don't care if there's one person in the audience or there's a million. If I can touch one person, if I could save one life from going through what I went through and put my whole family through, then everything I went through is all worth it. And that's how I feel about life. Amazing. Um, amazing. So I hadn't heard your full story before. I had a little inkling of what, what, what went on, but not the full depth of what. That's the tip of the iceberg. I wanted to cut and it down I, I short. Know, we, we were, we were, we were going to do it and we're trying to keep it to a nice yeah. track. But, but like, but so, you know, I, I don't know why I could interrupt you, um, with anything throughout that because <laughs> like, you, you can need to get it out. Like, yeah. <laughs> point, like, but, you know, a couple of things just came to me, um, you know, as you're, as you're talking and, and, you know, in that hospital for three weeks, you're in a coma <clears throat> and you did mention that you, um, you know, in theory, like you had three, you had died three times on the doctor side, the doctor and the people watching you, you had actually died three times. You in your coma, do you recall points that you knew something was happening? Descriptively. It's actually the first chapter in my book. It's, it's, it's my experience in the coma. That's how I open up the book is my dream state in the coma and everything totally to the T of what happened in that experience. Uh, I, I went to this dreamland. I watched my whole life fly by before my eyes. I was floating in the ocean helpless. And when I submitted and I gave up to God, he brought me back to, to, to the shore and, you know, uh, these people took care of me and there was this light and, I can't describe it in enough time to tell you. I know, you, I know, but, but I, 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 I yeah. felt it. I felt the, I felt the energy. I heard my mom's voice. It was the only voice that I heard when I was in the coma. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you are cognitively aware of what's going on. So, if any of your loved ones are in a coma, speak to them because they'll hear you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's just it was curious. I wanted to ask you that, like you know, because you have the doctors on the one side, you know, if you had a, if you had a TV screen and we could see you in the coma and then you see the scene with the, you know, like a movie and yeah. you see them being frantic, but what's happening at your end is just, you know, is very interesting to know what's going on for you. And it's great to know that it's in the It was a beautiful <laughs> experience. It was a beautiful and podcast on that separate. It was a beautiful and terrifying experience all at the same time. It really was. And, and I, and I, I can't, I explained it so well. 
I did yeah. so many different uh, exercises to bring it back to to descript beautifully describe what I went through in the coma. And the, the first chapter is a short chapter, but it's all of what happened in that coma. And it was scary, terrifying, but beautiful at the same time. Wow. So when you came around those three weeks when they actually had nearly pretty much signed you off that you weren't going to come around the, the last time, but you did, even though you had all the tubes and all of that, um, were you fully aware that you were coming back from this beautiful dream state into possible reality as it was on the ground? Because I imagine in the experience, you weren't on the ground, you were in that lovely space of protectedness, but then all of a sudden you wake up and you're, as they say, back to reality. So I started praying in my dream state. One of the first times I ever prayed in my life in the coma, I was praying. I miss my family. I wish I could just see my mom and my dad and my brother just one more time because I thought I was in this uh, third world country island and, and these people that I couldn't see their faces were around and there was this light above my head. I remember praying like, I just want to see my mom. I want to see my dad. You know, I miss them. I hope I get to see them again. And uh, it, it didn't just, I wasn't aware of the sh shift, but it was like, there was a huge light above my head and the lights started dimming and the peripheral started brightening up. And before I knew it, I was in the hospital and my parents were surrounded me. It was like a, it was like a dream come true because they, they had answered my prayer. They were right there. Like I couldn't believe it. You know? Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, there's, there's no way of obviously being able to comprehend that. It's one of those things you can, you can, and I imagine your chapter, you're, you're being as descriptive as possible, but there is most likely a limitation on the words that you can use. that would really capture. Yeah. It, I mean, I did my absolute best. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was like an experience I never felt. I didn't yeah. feel like I was in my body, but I also did. I felt like I was, I was alone, but I also felt like I had something there. Uh, yeah. I knew it wasn't my family. I knew at times I thought I was going to be floating in the middle of the ocean for the rest of my life for eternity. And mm -hmm. then, and I was watching my life in the sky. And, and then when I got taken, I felt good. Sometimes I felt bad. So maybe that was the fluctuation of me mm -hmm. dying, living, yeah. dying, living, you know, uh, I don't know how that worked out, but yeah. whatever it is, yeah. I'm so grateful that it did. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, so you'd gone through, you know, the whole childhood of the 10 and then the whole story up to 18 and, you know, hit, hit that point where was that point in, in the kitchen, you know, um, with the macaroni and cheese. And that's the point where you were given the chance. Not quite there, you did, but, but that was your tipping point. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I tried to get clean a few times. Yeah. My father gave me an ultimatum. He said, listen, mm -hmm. I can help you right now. If you want to go right now. But I had my girlfriend in the bed. He was asking me to leave for two years. I didn't trust her. You know, so I was like, I'm not leaving my girlfriend here for two years. That was the main reason why I didn't want to go. Because I was like, mm -hmm. I'm not leaving my girl here for two years because she's not going to be my girl by the time I get back. Uh, that was my main concern in my, in my yeah. stoner head, uh, that uh, my girl was going to cheat on me, that she was going to be, you know, get mm -hmm. have sex with somebody else or whatever that might have looked like. But I wasn't about to have that. And the fact that he said two years, I was like, no way. Mm -hmm. If he would have said a month, yeah, I would have yeah. probably said yes, because I knew I had a problem. Yeah. I was in the jerks. I was in the union job. I was taking pills at my job just so I can go to work, just so I can afford my pills, just so I can go to work. I was stuck in this vicious cycle and I couldn't get out of bed unless I took two thirties before I even got out of bed and, and then lay down and let them hit me. And then I would take another 30 milligram oxycodone every three to four hours for the remainder of the day. I was spending seven to $900 a week on painkillers to make $1,200. And then if you, if you include lunches and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and travel and whatever else life throws at you, I was negative every week. Mm -hmm. I was borrowing money by Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So it was a vicious, like I knew I needed a problem. Mm -hmm. I got fired from every job because I was an awesome worker. I was a leader. I was a boss, but I was a maniac. I'm hanging off. Of, I did concrete labor and I built high rises in New York city. I'm hanging off the side of the building, 40 stories in the air, no safety, like hanging off the building, looking up, doing crazy things. It was just crazy. My job was to build the next floor and where there was no safety. If I fell, I died. And that was my job was to build the forms for the next floor. And, you know, it was just a really, really unsafe hectic situation and i couldn't see the forest for the trees because i was completely hot mm -hmm. yeah it was it was a bomb about to go off yeah and so it, certainly and all the all the work that you've done for yourself since you know the point where you realized you did actually have the power 
you actually had the power all along to create the solution um, step by step, baby steps, because that's the important. It's not a race. There's not a timer. You just take the little piece at a time. But all that work that you did, when you look back on it now, how do you see, how do you feel about that whole lifespan of those first 18, 19 years? What does it mean when you look back on it? How do you feel about it? What does it mean to you now? Uh, I still deal with the, the, the trauma that it's done uh, with maybe some, some inner insecurities, um, feelings of worthiness, because everybody in my field thinks I'm the best in my field and this and that. I still in my mind have, um, what's it called? Uh, imposter syndrome, you know? And then every one of my clients are like, you're amazing. You've gave me so many incredible shifts, but I'm in my head. I'm like, I'm not doing anything, you know? So I still have this trauma from feeling like I'm not worth what I am. And it's because I got bullied as a little kid from two years old to about 13. I was told I was shit. I was, excuse me, I don't mean to curse on your podcast. I was no good. I was this, I was that, I was rotten. My stepbrother, the one that used to bully me, he was the best baseball player in New York City. Uh, I was always in his shadow and I was never good enough. And my mother and father broke up and my father was cheating on my mom when we were kids. And I watched all this I just watched all this craziness and hectiness and I was loved, but all my uh, family members were alcoholics. They were functional, but they were young. They were in their twenties. They were drinking, getting smashed. And I'm sitting at the table, like, you know, watching my mom get smacked and my father owned the bar. You know what I'm saying? Like I was just in a really bad thing, but what it taught me is how important those years are from two to seven, two to eight for kids, for their for their progression of who they become. Your personality comes from those ages. There's nothing you could do about it. So what I really wanna do when I have kids is really be attentive to my child and give them the amazing, let them know their love, let them know they're important, they're special, they could do anything because that is gonna follow them around for the rest of their lives. I've tried to do therapy, I've tried to do NLP, I've tried to do all these things and I've gotten better, but internally somewhere in there i always feel worthless i'm very confident i'm very decisive i'm a very you know leader and things like that but inside i always feel that way and my childhood taught me a lot i'm grateful for it because it taught me about trauma it taught me about addiction it taught me how to treat people it and i and i experienced so many things you know i went i was hanging out in the hood you know with gangbangers and then I was hanging out with the upper echelons of society, you know, and I went from each ways. I played sports. I was in the honors class. I was in the bottom. I had a wide variety of experiences. So I don't regret it. It was challenging. It was tough. It was painful, but I wouldn't change it for the world because it made me who I am today. And I'm proud of who I am today. And my mother's, most of all, my mother's proud of me. So, you know, I don't care what anybody else says. Oh, absolutely. And, and that was actually the piece I wanted to kind of just, I suppose, hear that, that yes, the challenges, the trauma of that, ex, like, childhood that it was experienced for you because it was unique for you. It's, it's your piece. And sometimes the trauma doesn't have to be big. It can be very small, but it still has that impact on those childhood years that you bring into adulthood. But recognizing that there was learnings in it for you, that again, as you said, you wouldn't change it because it has you where you are now, where you can now give back, where you can yeah. help and support others. Because without those significant learnings, you wouldn't be able to do, you know, the piece that you're doing. Yeah. So one, I just I don't want to cut you up, but I don't want to, yeah, no, to no. say this. So I tell these to my clients all the time, and I learn this through life. Every single day, every single moment, every single second is either a blessing or a lesson. Think about everything. Think about the worst things yeah. that ever happened to you. The craziest stories. You got a flat. You had to walk 10 miles in the rain. It was a snowstorm. In the moment, it sucked. But you know what? Five years from now, it's a great story to tell. All the memories that we talk about are always the worst experiences that we ever had. You need to start telling. You're at a family party and you're telling stories. Yeah, but oh, remember this one time that we were out there, I had no money on me, I had to walk 50 miles in the snow, and it was crazy, but then we pulled <laughs> up to that plate. Like, you know, that's how life is, mm. you know, you learn from the lessons, and everything else is a blessing, so I feel like everything is a blessing, mm. that's how I live my life, because either it's a lesson or a blessing, and lessons are blessings, 
Yes. You know, there's always a gold nugget to take from every single experience, whether you're suffering, whether you're struggling, whether it's pain, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a yin and a yang to everything without pain. There can't be joy. If, if, if there was no such thing as pain, everything would just be, be, it would just be, there would be no good. There'd be no bad. There'd be nothing to judge it from. Everybody has a homeostatic function. You know what I'm saying? That's why people that win the lottery, they're like, yeah, all my prayers are answered for three months. And then they're back to how they felt before they got the money. And usually they lose it all and they uh -huh. end up exactly where they are financially. Yes. You know, so you yeah. need those ups and downs. There's no such thing as ups all the time. For the people struggling with depression, sadness, suicidal thoughts, it's okay to be sad. Embrace it. But tell somebody. Share it with somebody, find a resource, find a support system, find something that makes you happy, find fulfillment, find a mission, find a purpose, find something that sets your soul on fire. I'm not saying every day is going to be easy, but it's going to make it worth it because I struggle with neck. I was doing painkillers because I had a bad neck and back. Guess what? I still have a bad neck and back, but you know what? I have a missing leg and I have nerve damage throughout my bottle body and I'm 10 years older and I'm way more pain now but I've learned to deal with my pain. I learned to embrace it. And it, you know what? The days that I feel pretty good, I'm so grateful about it. I'm like, wow, my back doesn't hurt today. Let's go and celebrate. Let's go get a steak dinner, you know? Because it makes you appreciate the times that are actually fun and important and precious to you. So embrace the suck. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a great note to finish on. <laughs> Obviously, as you said, this is only the tip of the iceberg of what we could possibly go into. And it's probably layer podcast number one uh, with yourself, Kevin Parker. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, the everything, and I've just written it down, everything is either a blessing or a lesson. It's yeah. just, it's, it's fabulous. Um, and lessons are blessings. So we will yeah. definitely sum up the the discussion with that is your statement um and your final final message to anyone who's listening here today that just even after listening to you is just i just can't hear it kevin just what is it that that i need to hear to just really give this thing um a second chance to just get out of this yeah pond of mud be true to yourself be okay with suffering be okay with failure Fail fast, fail often, but keep failing forward. But always look for the golden nugget in life. Always look for the thing that sets your soul on fire, that makes you passionate, that makes you excited about life. Because life is not always going to be good, but it's always going to be worth it. Fabulous. Fabulous. Brilliant. Kevin, thank you so much. Yeah, so I just want to reiterate, if any of you guys want to get in touch with me or read my book for free, you can text the word WARRIOR to 55312. I'd love to connect with you. I'd love to share some stories with you. And I'd love for you to read my book. Uh, I hope I helped you. I hope you've enjoyed uh, our oh, time together. Oh, amazing. Your passion just <laughs> bursts, bursts through the screen here. Um, as I said, in Ireland, talking to you over in America. So, And I, I am so grateful for these opportunities to to be able to do this i mean the blessings of technology are just like yeah. amazing um i don't think we appreciate half of what we can do you know to get us all through lockdown how we were able to just go online you know lockdown 15 years ago that wouldn't have been the case so we're just you know all this sort of stuff to be able to do this so we, that we can you know release stories out to the world to share to help and inspire others so um again thank you very much kevin so we will put up the podcast we have all those notes I, uh, may i share just over. i just may i share one more thing because i don't oh, want to so, so i have my own uh podcast it's called true warrior success podcast uh i've started it about two months ago there's a lot um, of really exciting stories on it so if you'd like to hear more I love to have you as a guest. Brilliant. So True Warrior show. Success Podcast. Look that yes. up on iTunes and uh, listen in. Yes. Amazing stories. Great inspiration. And um, as I said, your, your uh, business is True Warrior and you are a men's success coach. So if anybody is listening to this today, it just feels that they would like that little bit of conversation to reach out either by the text or even just look you up online, all your details. Yeah, you could find me if you look up my name. You could go to truewarriorsuccess.com, kevinparkerspeaks.com. 
I mean, I'm all over. You put Kevin Parker and addiction in and I'm showing up. So. <laughs> Excellent. What, a, what an amazing. And you could find this, from... you could find this book on Amazon. There's a, there's an audible version for the people that don't read, uh, don't, read, don't like to read. So there's an audible version and a paperback. So I'm sorry. I don't mean to keep cutting. Yeah, no, no, no. There's I, so much information. You, know, you just said that when you said, you know, you just type in that and you'll just find me. I'm just going to show up there. Yeah. Referred to your line, you know, 15 minutes ago where you're lying on the bed having spent an hour and a half trying to climb up those stairs and wondering what was the point and I'll just give up because what was her? You know, if you compare those two statements, like, I mean, who would know, but you need a <laughs> little tiny, tiny, tiny thing nugget that just said, just try one more time, just yeah. Give it one more shot. And now we type in your name and voila, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> so brilliant 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 thank you kevin and thank you everybody for listening thank you so today. much and we'll be back again with another share your story very soon and all the notes um are in the podcast at the bottom of the show notes or whatever way you call it and we will chat again soon thank you kevin have a Excellent. great day have everybody a great day. take care bye